Hi, and welcome to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. So far in the course, we've been talking about different phenomena that people started to notice around the beginning of the 20th century that couldn't be explained using the ideas of classical mechanics. So far, we've looked at both blackbody radiation and the photoelectric effect, and today I want to tell you yet another phenomenon, the emission spectrum of hydrogen. As we'll see, this will lead to us thinking about the relationship between particles and waves, and will even make us question what a particle really is in the first place. And it's part of what makes quantum mechanics fun to think about. I'm talking about wave-particle duality. You might remember that in my last video, I told you about how Albert Einstein showed that light acts like a particle. It can knock electrons off the surface of a metal just like a particle would. If you haven't seen that video, you might want to give it a look. Well, the problem is that about a hundred years earlier, another scientist showed that light isn't a particle. Instead, light's a wave. That was done in 1803 by Thomas Young, exactly 102 years before Einstein showed that light can act like a particle. Young also has the honor of being the only scientist I've talked about so far in these videos who doesn't have a mustache or a beard, but he was a pretty bright guy anyway. Young's proof that light's a wave is amazingly simple. All you need to do is take a light source, let the light shine on a card that has two really narrow slits cut into it. Then you look at the pattern of light that comes out the other side of the card. What kind of pattern should we see? Well, if light's made of particles, Einstein called them photons, then we might expect them to act like bullets, meaning they travel in a straight line. The ones that hit the card would bounce off or maybe get absorbed by the card but the ones that happen to go through a slit would make it to the other side. If we look at where the photons go, we'd expect to see two spots, one for each of the slits that the photons pass through. On the other hand, if light's a wave instead of a particle, we'll see something much different. Imagine that the waves act like water waves. In that case, they'd hit the card and be able to get through only where the slits are. So on the other side of the card, you'd end up with two waves, one coming from each of the two slits. Now pretty soon, those two waves would meet each other on the other side. When they do, something interesting happens. Again, imagine water waves. If two water waves happen to meet, then the waves would combine. The tops of the waves would add together to become even higher than they were before. The same thing would happen with light waves. The half circles that you see here are the tops of the light waves. Wherever the tops meet, they add together and become higher. For a light wave, a higher wave means brighter light. So if we put a card down here, what we'd see is bright spots where the tops of the waves meet and darker spots in between. That's what's called an interference pattern. So we have a way to decide whether light's a particle or a wave. If it's a particle, when we do the experiment, we'll see two bright spots on the far side of the slits. But if it's a wave, we'll see a pattern of a lot of bright and dark spots. So let's do that experiment. What I have here is a laser. It makes a nice bright green dot. And I've set it up so that it shines on a white plate. Now, in front of the laser, I'll put a card that has two tiny slits very close together. And what you see is that we do get a pattern of bright and dark stripes. That tells us that light is a wave. If it were acting like a particle, I'd just see two dots, one for each of the slits. Now here's something else I can try. If I move the two slits closer together or farther apart, the bright and dark spots change their positions because the light waves now meet each other in slightly different places. And now we can do something else fun. Right now, the two slits are right next to each other. But what if I have more than two slits and I don't put them all in a row? I put some of them to the left or to the right of the others. If I do that, I get a neat pattern. Here's what we get with four slits arranged in a square. It's very complex. The light wave gets split into four parts by the slits and those parts meet each other on the other side of the card in a complicated way. So we get a very complicated pattern. And it's kind of pretty. And here's what we get if I have six slits arranged in a hexagon. 
instead of just four, we get a really nice star-shaped pattern. But now we have a problem. These experiments seem to prove that light acts like a wave. But as we saw in an earlier video, Einstein showed that light is made of photons, which are particles. So what's going on here? Is light a wave? Or is it a particle? Or is it both? Or is it something completely different? A big hint to the answers to those questions came in 1924, thanks to Louis de Broglie. The de Broglie's were a very old aristocratic family. Louis himself was a duke, and his brother Maurice was also a physicist and a duke. The two of them had ancestors including other dukes and counts, princesses, countesses, a bishop, and two prime ministers of France. Their family was so important that some of these portraits that you see here were painted by the greatest artists of the day, including Jean Eng and Edgar Degas. So what did Louis de Broglie discover? He was interested in Einstein's idea that light, which we usually think of as a wave, can act as though it's made of particles. De Broglie wondered, in that case, do things that we usually think of as being particles sometimes act like waves? In other words, could an apparently solid object, like an electron, actually act like a wave? To find out, he combined two of Einstein's simplest but most important discoveries. Here's the first one. As I mentioned in an earlier video, Einstein said that the energy of a photon of light is equal to h times nu, where the Greek letter nu is the frequency of the light. The second of Einstein's ideas that Louis de Broglie used was his most famous equation, E equals mc squared. That's energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, where c is the speed of light. De Broglie noticed that we use the second equation to understand the energies of particles, but the first equation is for the energy of light, which, up until Einstein, people usually thought of as being a wave. So De Broglie had a new idea. He thought, if particles can act like waves, then both these equations should apply. We shouldn't think that one equation works only for waves, and the other one works only for particles. If an electron can act like a wave or a particle, then both equations should give its energy. So now I'm going to do a little bit of math. But don't worry, it's not too complicated, and it's a neat bit of logic. If you really don't want to see the math, you can skip forward a couple of minutes in this video. Anyway, since both equations have e on the left side, the right sides should be equal to each other. Now the right side here has frequency in it. But it's a little easier to picture a wave's wavelength instead of its frequency. So let's change this. It turns out that the frequency of a light wave is equal to c divided by the wavelength. Wavelength has the symbol Greek letter lambda. So let's put that in now for the frequency. If de Broglie was right that a particle can act like a wave, now we can figure out its wavelength. We just need to get lambda, the wavelength, all by itself in this equation. When we do, here's what we get. And now we can simplify that a bit by making one of the c's cancel out. And now one last thing. c stands for the speed of light, but Einstein showed that a particle with mass, like an electron, can't go as fast as c. Instead, it has to go at a slower speed. Let's call that v for the velocity of our particle. So, if a particle acts like a wave, its wavelength will be equal to h, that's Planck's constant, which I talked about in an earlier video, divided by the particle's mass times its speed. So let's use that equation. How long is the wavelength of a particle? Let's try this equation on electrons, like the ones that get shot at the screens of old TVs and computer monitors. If you plug in the mass and velocity of those electrons into this equation, you find out that they would have a wavelength of about a hundredth of a nanometer. That's really short, way short than a wavelength of ordinary visible light. So how can we tell if this equation is really true? Well, remember Young's double slit experiment? 
the one that showed that light acts like a wave. If electrons also really act like waves, we should be able to get the same kinds of pattern if we shoot electrons at a series of slits instead of light. But as we just saw, the wavelength of an electron is really, really short, so the slits will have to be much closer together than they were when we did the experiment with light. The easiest way to have slits that close together is to shoot the electrons at molecules. The electrons will get blocked when they hit an atom, but they can pass between the atoms. So the gaps between atoms act like slits for our electrons to go through. If we try it, here's what we see. Patterns. This is an interference pattern that electrons make when they pass through a molecule. It's not what you'd get if the electrons just acted like particles. This pattern shows that electrons can act like waves. Earlier, we got different patterns of light when we changed the distance between the slits. We also get different patterns of electrons if we change the distance between the atoms by changing the molecule. Each of these different patterns was made when electrons pass through a different kind of molecule. So back to our original question. Are electrons and light particles or waves? De Broglie's work makes the answer a little easier to see. One way to think of the answer is, an electron is a particle. But the word particle doesn't mean what we thought it meant. The same thing is true for light. Light is made of particles, called photons. But it turns out particles aren't solid objects like most of us think of them. Instead, particles have a lot of the same properties that waves have. That's a tricky idea to wrap your head around, and even scientists with a lot of experience find it surprising at first. I'll talk more about that in future videos, and we'll see that the fact that particles are a little like waves leads to some really neat effects in the real world. Now one more thing. Look at this equation again. One thing you notice is that the mass is down here in the bottom of the fraction. So the heavier a particle is, the shorter its wavelength is. Now we already saw that the wavelength of an electron is much smaller than a wavelength of light. And anything that's big enough to see with your eyes would weigh millions of times more than an electron, so its wavelength would be even shorter. That's why solid objects never seem like waves to us. The wavelength of something large enough to see would be far too short for us to be able to notice. So you might wonder, if we can't sense that particles are like extremely short waves, does it really matter? Does any of this have an impact on the real world? And the answer is, it has a huge impact. Lots of things in technology, in chemistry, and even in biology could never happen if particles didn't act a little like waves. Just like waves, particles have a wavelength. But that's really hard to visualize. What does it mean to say that on really small scales a particle's like a wave? Today I want to help you get a picture of how it's possible, and we'll start to see that it's a really important idea to grasp if we want to understand how atoms and molecules really work. Now here's why it seems like an impossible idea that particles are just like waves. When we think of a wave, we usually think of something like this, a sine wave. And one thing that jumps out at you right away about a sine wave is that it stretches on forever. It doesn't have a beginning or an end, and that definitely doesn't seem to be true for particles, which do have an edge. But in the last video, I told you that particles don't actually have a well-defined edge. Instead, particles act as though they fade out at the edges. But even if you buy the idea that particles have fuzzy edges, that's not the same as saying they stretch on forever. Or is it? Well, the wave that describes a particle is called a wave function. And it turns out that the height of a wave function, which we call its amplitude, tells us how likely it is we'd find the particle at any particular point. So, we're more likely to find the particle where the wave function has a high amplitude. The trouble is, sine waves stretch on forever, and the height of the peaks is the same all the way down the wave. So if this sine wave were the wave function of a real particle, like an electron, it would mean that the electron was stretched across a huge area, an infinitely large area actually. 
And everywhere along the wave we looked, we'd be equally likely to find the electron, because the height of this wave is the same. And this picture of the wave function is where the problem is. We're trying to imagine how a particle could act like a sine wave. And as you can see, that gives us results that are really confusing. And they should be, because particles don't act like sine waves. But waves can have lots of other shapes besides sine waves. So now let's think about a particle like an electron. And instead of a sine wave, let's try to imagine what kind of wave would act like a real particle. Imagine I gave you a box and told you there was a particle in it, and your job was to guess where the particle is. If that's all I told you, you might think the particle is equally likely to be anywhere in the box. So without more information, you couldn't really narrow down where it is. In that case, you'd say the probability of finding the particle is the same everywhere in the box. The wave function for that would just look like a sine wave. It would fill the whole box, and the peaks would have the same amplitude everywhere. But now suppose I told you the particle is most likely to be at one particular place in the box. Let's say it has a 30% chance of being at that spot. And the further away from the spot you get, the less likely it is you'll find the particle. So in that case, you might imagine that the odds of finding the particle tail off the further away you get from the spot. So the probability might look something like this, a bell-shaped curve. And what would the wave function look like? Well, the particle acts like a wave, so imagine combining the bell-shaped curve with a sine wave. If we do that, we get something that looks like this. This is still a wave. It still has peaks and valleys like a normal wave does. And if you measure the distance between one peak and the next, you can see it still has a wavelength just like a sine wave. But because we used a bell-shaped curve to make this new wave, its amplitude is much higher over here, where we said the odds of finding the particle are the highest. This kind of shape is sometimes called a wave pulse, or wave packet, because the tallest part is all right here in one package. When a particle is moving through space, we can think of it as a wave packet moving. The place where we see the particle is where the wave packet has its highest amplitude. But what about the ends of the wave out here past the edge of the particle? What happened to the wave out there? Well, remember, we made this wave packet by combining a sine wave and a bell-shaped curve. Now most of the bell-shaped curve is here close to the middle. The tails of the bell-shaped curve get very small very quickly. But they never quite drop off to zero. That means that way out here, the height of the curve is very tiny. But it's still there. And that means that our wave packet still exists out there. Its amplitude is just very, very small. In fact, the wave packet stretches on forever, just like the original sine wave did. So that means that when you get just a short distance away from the center, the wave packet has an amplitude close to zero. And the further away you get, the smaller the amplitude is. But it never quite goes away. The odds of finding the particle in this region are way over 99%, but there's still a tiny, tiny chance that the particle can be outside that area. And that's what I mean when I say that the edges of a particle are blurry and not well-defined. What seems to be a solid particle is actually a wave. So if the wave function stretches out forever in every direction, that means the particle can occupy all of that space. Particles seem to occupy only a small area, but there's always a tiny chance, an extremely tiny chance, that we'll suddenly find the particle far away from where we expect it. That makes it really hard to get a simple picture of what a particle looks like. If it's 99.99% .99 likely that we'll find the particle in this area, then most of that time, that's exactly where we'll see it. And we get used to the idea that the particle stays in that one spot forever as long as we don't deliberately move it. But quantum mechanics tells us that the wave function doesn't stop where we see the edge of the particle. Instead, it continues forever, although it's very small. That means that we're extremely unlikely to see the particle way over here, but it's still very remotely possible. Huh.
That might be the most important and far-reaching idea in quantum mechanics. The fact that particles actually act like waves profoundly affects the way all of matter behaves. And it affects almost every application of technology we've come up with in the last 50 years. It's an idea that's crucial for computers, for nuclear energy, for lasers, for the space program, for medicine, and lots more. It even impacts pop culture in the form of Schrodinger's cat. I'm going to spend a few episodes of this series talking about those applications and the cat, and how they're all possible because of the fact that particles actually act like waves. But before I stop for today, I want to point out something important. The picture of a wave packet I gave you a little while ago is really oversimplified. A wave packet isn't really just a combination of a sine wave and a bell-shaped curve. Wave packets actually have more complicated shapes than that, and what they look like depends a lot on what the particle is and how it interacts with other things in its environment. If we really want to understand quantum mechanics and use it to invent new technologies and understand things like chemical reactions and lasers and radiation, we need to know what those wave functions actually look like and how they act. The fact that particles have wave-like characteristics has one more very important consequence. In 1926, the German physicist Werner Heisenberg realized that it isn't possible to know all the properties of an object, like an electron, with infinite precision. For example, we can't know the exact position of an electron infinitely well. That makes a lot of sense based on what we've been talking about in the last couple of videos. Particles have wave-like behavior, so they don't have well-defined edges. To be more exact, what Heisenberg realized is that some properties of an object come in pairs, called complementary variables. The more precisely we know the value of one complementary variable, the less precisely we can know the value of the other one. For example, two such complementary variables are the position of a particle and its momentum. So, the precision with which we know a particle's position puts an upper limit on how well we can also know its momentum. We can write that this way. Here, delta x is the uncertainty in the position of the particle, and delta p is the uncertainty in the particle's momentum. This equation tells us that the product of the two uncertainties must be greater than or equal to h, which is Planck's constant, over 4 times pi. The important thing to notice about this equation is that in order for the inequality to be true, both delta p and delta h must be greater than 0. So it's not possible to know either the position or the momentum perfectly. This is a consequence of the fact that particles actually have characteristics of a wave, and waves don't have a well-defined position or momentum. This is also a good time to introduce a new symbol that we'll use very often in this course. The quantity on the right side of the inequality is often written this way. This symbol is called h-bar, and it's equal to Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. h over 2 pi is a quantity that occurs in many of the equations of quantum mechanics, so it's convenient to have a symbol for it to save us a little writing. As I mentioned earlier, the position and momentum of a particle are called complementary variables. It turns out that there are several other pairs of complementary variables, and they obey an inequality similar to the one we've seen for position and momentum. For example, another pair of complementary variables are the energy of a particle and the point in time when it has that energy. So the precision with which we can know these two properties is limited by this equation. The idea that the precision of complementary variables is limited by this general equation is known as the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, and it's one of the most fundamental ideas in quantum mechanics. Well, that's enough new material for now. Next time we talk, we'll start delving more deeply into the mathematics that underlies the wave aspects of particles. It's really our first step toward an understanding of quantum mechanics and a much deeper understanding of what it really means for matter to have the characteristics of a wave. I hope you'll join me for that. But in the meantime, have a good week.